Well, again, thank you all for allowing me to participate in this program. Um, the title, oligometastatic disease, is radical experimental, or should it be done in the context of a clinical trial, uh, and the role of radiotherapy in treatment of bone mets. I think that's sort of um, pretty clear that we don't have good level one evidence to, to, to do this, but there's a body of literature. And so it's a little unclear um, how do you resolve this topic and how do you design the trials to answer the questions. And so I'm not sure how much we disagree, but we'll find out, and I look forward to your feedback. So um, those are my disclosures. We have good evidence that short courses of radiotherapy are very effective in palliating metastatic disease. In this particular trial, we compared 800 times 1 versus 300 times 10 in people, 900 patients, half of them had prostate cancer, half of them had breast cancer. And the bottom line is that they were equally effective. The toxicity was actually a little bit less in the 800 times 1. Uh, and uh, we also, so we concluded that they were similar. The retreatment rate was slightly higher in the 800 times 1 compared to the 300 times 10. And we believe that was primarily because we felt more comfortable re-irradiating someone that had already only had 800 versus those people that had 3,000. So the bottom line is that there's clear-cut evidence that, number one, that the response rate to radiation for bone mets is about 75%. And number two, that 800 times 1 is as good as 300 times 10. So short-course radiotherapy, which you would use in the setting of oligometastatic disease, is well established based on data. What makes the problem more complicated is that we don't know what dose we should give. Is it better to give more than 800 times 1? We could give you know, 20 gray rather than 8 gray in a single fraction. And then there are also what we call the non-classic radiation effects. So this is from a study looking at using radiation. You radiate tumors, and then you create what we call neoantigens. When you radiate a bulky tumor, the tumor releases these fragments of tumor into the circulation. And some of these, people have argued, induce something called an obscopal response in which you treat a local area only with a high dose of radiation, and the metastases respond. Uh, some people use the term, again, the obscopal effect. Other people call this a form of auto-vaccination, that this is a form of vaccinating the immune system to respond in a metastatic foci. And there are a whole host of animal models looking at, uh, this is one, you'll, you'll, you'll see that at the top line, this is irradiating, uh, and then you give these T cells two days after, and then on the far, on your right, you'll see 12 out of 12 rejection of tumors. The, the issue here is that if you wait till four days after, you don't get the effect if you do it, you know, so there's various schemes that you can try, but there's something real here that's been validated in multiple kinds of animal models showing that small volume, high dose radiation can stimulate the immune system and large volume radiation can suppress the immune system. This is another example. This is a breast cancer model where they treated tumor on one side and monitored the response of the tumor on the opposite side. In this case, they gave 20 gray in one fraction versus 800 times 3 versus 600 times 5. And it turned out that the 800 times 3 worked, but the, three, but the, 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 the uh, 600 times 5 and the 20 gray in one fraction were not as effective. And this shows um, in, the, in these graphs, if you look at the, uh, the one on your, on your left, uh, you'll see that the, the suppression of tumor growth was most impressive with 800 times 3. And this is, there are a whole host of these, of these studies that have been published. This is, that's animal models. This is a human. This is, these are patients with lymphoma that's resistant to chemotherapy in which they radiated not all the other sites of involvement, but a localized area induced an immune response and had impressive uh, responses in humans with local radiation, using radiation to stimulate the immune system. Here's another uh, study done in metastatic melanoma and renal cell. This was done by one of my former residents up in Oregon. And they, again, radiated one area with stereotactic body radiotherapy and then gave IL-2 and induced 
a profound response in groups of patients that are traditionally very resistant to any form of chemotherapy. So the point I'm trying to make here is that it's more than just giving high dose radiation to one localized area when we talk about treating oligometastatic disease. I didn't spend any time trying to define what oligometastatic disease is. I think my colleague's gonna talk a little bit about that. But assuming that you have your definition of oligometastatic disease, it's more than just necessarily local uh, control. And uh, finally, this is a, this is a prostate cancer uh, animal model looking at the effect of hormone therapy. It turns out that hormone therapy stimulates the immune system. And the optimal time to give the hormone therapy after radiation in this animal model, this rat um, model, is two weeks after the radiation. So there's different, there's all kinds of studies, that, and I'm, I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to fast forward. There's radiation is being given with PD-1. Uh, and one of the problems comes back to the slide which I showed uh, yesterday, which is that when you're using these retrospective post hoc studies and you're reporting impressive results, one of the reasons that it becomes difficult to interpret the results is patient selection. So here again, you know, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the mortality in men who undergo radical prostatectomy, the overall hazard ratio is 0.47, which means they have half the mortality of other men. When you have highly selected series in which you take patients and you administer some novel treatment to them, and then they have a better than expected survival, it's impossible to determine whether this is due to patient selection or the treatment itself. So I really do think that, uh, that, there's, uh, that there's no high level evidence that stereotactic radiotherapy for oligometastatic disease makes people live longer. But we have retrospective and, and a biologic rationale. I shared some of that with you that number one, high dose local radiotherapy is very effective for the local treatment. And then there's also the exciting potential to combine it with immunotherapy to enhance a more, to get a more systemic response. It's unique in this way uh, in terms of the ability to stimulate the immune system with auto vaccination or so-called epscopal effect. Uh, but much work needs to be done. And, uh, the role of radiotherapy in this setting really needs to be defined, and, and there's even less data uh, on the role, uh, excuse me, less data on the role of radical prostatectomy in this setting, but I think there's compelling evidence that radiotherapy could play an important role. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much again for the organizing committee to be here. Um, and Professor Roach already addressed that we both had the same situation that uh, Professor Tombal and uh, Professor Fisazi had yesterday in the debate. We actually have the same feeling about this, this issue. And I will come from a more pragmatical, more clinical uh, point of view and showing you um, why you can do or should do um, oligometastatic treatment uh, in prostate cancer patients outside of clinical trials. These are the disclosures. Um, and first is we don't have a definition on what is oligometastatic disease. There is no common and no consens about this definition. And you, here you can see uh, the data from uh, different clinical trials is the SWOG trial, the ECOG trial, and the GTUC trial. And they all use some two, three <coughs> bone lesions. Uh, there are no visceral metastatic lesions uh, involved in these definitions. So what we first need for oligometastatic disease is a, a definition we need in the future, a consensus about this, and then we can compare different clinical trials. But what is important as well is that um, all these trials and all these information are based on the nowadays still recommended clinical uh, workup of the patients, the staging we have, and that's classically done by CT and bone scan. But what we have now is a rapidly changing landscape, and we were discussing this over the last couple of days, and, and you are all aware of this. Uh, the modern imaging assessment concept, uh, including coline PET, including PSMA PET, including whole body MRI and new MRI techniques, of course, results in 
more patients that we identify at an earlier stage uh, with metastatic disease. And the question is, what does that mean for the patient? And what does that mean for us as physicians, how we treat these patients? These techniques are, are all high, very high diagnostic uh, accurate, and they, but they are lacking demonstrating the benefit in patient outcome. So what we are dealing with is a completely new context. Now we have a newly diagnosed oligometastatic patient based on new imaging modalities. We have oligorecurrent, oigonadal patient, hormone sensitive, and we have the castration resistant patient that has an oligometastatic disease. Uh, and this is a completely new situation based on the new imaging modalities. So let's come to a patient. This is Mr. A, 61 years old. He has a PSA of 29. He has a T3B disease on his MRI. Um, he has a Gleason 3 plus 4 with 8 out of 12 uh, course positive, 90% positive. And he had a CT and a bone scan that were both negative. And the recommendation of the multidisciplinary tumor board for this patient was based on the literature that he could either undergo radical prostatectomy plus minus adjuvant or salvage treatments. Patients should be informed about this. Um, and the other alternative would be external beam radiotherapy um, plus ADT for three years. So now the guy had to think a little bit about this and took some time and then decided for radiation oncology and he got a second MRI and what we have seen in this second MRI is this bone lesion in the symphysis. So the patient was re-referred to the tumor board and we discussed the case again. So what to do with this patient? So we do local treatment and throw away the MRI protocol. Uh, we do local treatment, one of the both. Uh, plus radiotherapy of, the, of this bone metastasis, plus six months of hormones. Or we go for stampede trial, we are participating in stampede trial, and go for ADT plus docetaxel. Well, that's obviously, well, we don't know what to do with these patients. But what we know from locally advanced high-risk populations is that denying local control and go for ADT alone uh, would never be discussed in these patients if we were not aware of this metastasis because we have data that support treatment of the primary. So the second thing is that overall survival in these patients with oligometastatic disease is rather long. And third thing is that local, local regional symptoms uh, affect many patients uh, that we see in this setting. And added um, metastasis targeted therapy is a reasonable option. Makes sense. There's only one metastasis. Why not treat this metastasis? So these are the data from the SPCG7 trial showing that ADT plus radiotherapy is more effective than ADT alone. That's a, a a very strong indicator that local tumor control is beneficial for these patients. And here you can see the outcome data of the trials that I've shown you at the beginning with the different definitions. So if you have a low volume disease, and this is quite consistent uh, in these studies, if you have a small amount of, or smaller amount of metastasis, then uh, the median overall survival is around seven years. And that's here again in a table, very, very consistent. And what does that mean for the patient? He's if, is he living long enough to suffer from local problems? Yes, that's an older study uh, by Gunnar Aus. And you can see that the mean survival time of these patients was rather low. It was 26 months it's from the 90s. Uh, but one out of four of the patients had to undergo in this short term period TRP, one out of three had radiotherapy, and 12% had uh, treatment of upper urinary tract problems. So, did this change over time? We always believe that 
Nowadays, we don't see these patients anymore. No, it didn't change at all. It's a study from Johann Lorio, and showed that in, in the actual time, in our times now, in the PSA era, and you can see that this is almost this, the same. So 80% of the patients uh, with bone metastasis had complications, and almost all of these patients during their lifetime had local treatment due to local symptoms of their primary tumor. So it makes sense to avoid these problems. And we can do this by radical prostatectomy. That's a feasibility study um, summarized from different institutions. And what you can see is that it is safe. The complication rates are acceptable. So radical prostatectomy is one of the treatment options. And there are data from population-based studies that are always critical and showing that radical prostatectomy might be better than radiotherapy. But we had a discussion yesterday, and you heard already about this, um, that it is limited. And we have data, and that's from Pete Ost, and he showed you on the first day of this meeting, uh, that we have patients, if we do such type of treatment, of oligometastatic treatment, that there is maybe a benefit for the patient. But of course, again, as Professor Roach already said, this is a highly selected population of patients. And what we don't know in this population is if the patient really benefits from it, or is this the natural cause of the disease, what we see here. That's highly heterogeneous. There are some tumors growing slowly. So did we pick these patients here and have good outcomes? Actually, we don't know. And I will do not go into details of the discussion if we should do radiotherapy or radical prostatectomy in this setting. Uh, we have this di discussion in the non-metastatic uh, uh, setting, and we have all these studies you have heard about yesterday, promoting surgery as the better uh, treatment, but there are so many limitations, and until we don't have a prospective randomized clinical trial showing that one treatment is better than the other. This is all nonsense. And I would like to refer you, if you are interested in this topic, to two editorial comments of both of the speakers of this session here, uh, one published uh, this year, one some time ago. Um, and you should read this, and then you get an impression about the value of these retrospective comparative data. So in summary, we have to say that oligometastatic prostate cancer is a result of modern imaging assessment. Radical prostatectomy is safe and feasible in men with metastatic disease. Local tumor control is something we have to think about. We must be aware of this, and we should try to avoid local symptoms that are suffering from many patients. But increasing, and we have increasing evidence that metastasis-targeted therapy is an option in selected men with oligometastatic disease. But I fully agree with my pre-speaker. We have, there are so many open questions. Definition, imaging, treatment of the local, of the primary, and how to do the radiotherapy of the, uh, of the metastasis or systemic treatment. We have to solve these problems within clinical trials. Thank you very much. Thank you.